Welcome back to Math 210 Calculus 1. So here we're talking about the uh, definite integral, and we foreshadowed it a little bit last time, uh, but we'll uh, really dive into it this time. There, there is a lot of material. There's no getting around it. There's a lot of material. There's a lot of definitions. Some of it is difficult to keep straight. I'll do my best to streamline this as much as possible, but you may find yourself needing to, to reread section 5.1 and 5.2 a, a couple times. And, and the YouTube videos will, will also help, hopefully. Let's just dive straight in. So I want to define for you what is the definite integral. And intuitively, the definition is quite simple. So if you have, let's see, and let me know if, if there's ever a problem with the audio or the video or anything. So if you have a, a function y equals f of f, f of x, I'll schematically draw its graph. Let's look at some interval on the x-axis from a to b. You have some function. Maybe that looks like this. Uh, what I'm going to define for you today, we call the integral, the definite integral of f of x from a to b. We use this funny notation that I'll explain in a moment, this integral from a to b of f of x dx. And what this is defined to be is it's defined to be the signed area from a to b. So intuitively, that's what you should think it is. And, and I'll give you something that's a bit more of a technical description in a little bit, but What is signed area intuitively? Uh, so here, like I've got the graph of a function, and, and let's restrict ourselves to um, continuous functions, CTS for continuous. There, there do exist functions that are not integrable. Let's not deal with that right now. It's, but, but every continuous function um, will be integrable from, from A to B. And so I want to look at um, what is this, what we call signed area. So if you look at the part of the function that's above the x-axis and look at the area, I'll call it A, area below the curve and above the axis, and if separately you look at the, for the part of the curve that's below the axis, you look at the area above the curve and below the axis, call that B, then the signed area is nothing but A minus B. So area above the axis minus area below the axis. And that's why we use uh, the word signed, uh, meaning that uh, you're, you're subtracting, like, the, like there is a sign, like you're, like you're subtracting the part that's below the x-axis. So in particular, if, if all of the function, if all the values of the function are non-negative, if everything's like above the x-axis, uh, then this will just be the area. Correspondingly, if everything was below the x-axis, then this would just be the negative of the area. And um, a little bit about this notation. So you're integrating x, your your f of x. You're inputting the function, and you're outputting this area relating to the function. Uh, this elong this integral sign. It's an elongated s. So s for sum. Um, 
as we'll see, this integral is a limit of approximating sums. We saw that last time when we looked at even like the area of a triangle was a limit of the right hand endpoint approximations. So you use the, uh, the elongated S for the integral sign to sort of indicate to you that you're taking a limit of sums. A and B tell you the range of X values that you're going from. And the, the DX, I'll explain that where that comes from in a, in a minute. And uh, to give you another like formula for this, remember that we had like different ways of approximating. You know, we had this right hand approximation, this midpoint approximation, and this left hand approximation. I'll draw the I'll draw the left hand approximation uh, here. Like you you take some some partition of the interval into equal widths, and you look at like left endpoint of the function to get the height. You draw the rectangles. So we saw this. Last time, so using left endpoints to. To get the get the rectangles and then adding them all up and then that's that's LN. And you can see this is a reasonable approximation to the signed area because these rectangles add up to kind of give you um, an approximation of the positive part. These wrangles, rectangles add up to give you an approximation of the, of the negative part. And as you get more and more rectangles, your approximation should get better and better. So in other words, as you take the limit, as n goes to infinity, you should get the signed area. It doesn't matter whether you take points. It doesn't matter whether you take right hand endpoints. Uh, either way, you can take the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, and I'll even expand out this formula with left endpoints. It's like limit as n goes to infinity of of what this sum. I goes from one to n. Left end point. Actually, it would be I goes from zero to n minus one because it's left end points. Uh, f of x i times delta x. And so this this limit of approximations um, will give you the signed area, and therefore will give you this integral from a to b f of x dx. And here you can start to see where this integral notation came from because um, so you're taking a sum to approximate. You've got the value of the function times delta into a limit. You're, so the notation, what we do is we stretch out the summation sign. So this kind of turns into that. And f of x i kind of turns into f of x, and the delta x kind of um, turns into dx. So the like the dx is sort of reminding us that we're partitioning the interval from a to b into smaller and smaller subintervals, and then taking a limit. And of course, you get like two other formulas for the, the right hand endpoints or or the midpoints. But um, it, it turns out that there are other ways to approximate the signed area. So you can basically do this any way you want, not just with right midpoints or um, left hand endpoints. And so when I'm formally defining the integral from A to B in general, uh, I'm actually going to want to use a, a definition that allows me to 
right, left, or midpoints, or any other approximation scheme that I want. I want a definition for the integral that, that contains all of those approximations. And so here's how I'm going to set that up. I do need a little bit of terminology in order to do this. So let's focus for a minute on just the x-axis and just focus on this interval from, from A to B. And I'm going to define something called a partition. So I'll use P for partition. And this is just going to be any way of, of splitting up the interval from A to B into like smaller subintervals. But now I'm no longer going to require that they have I'm no longer going to require that these subintervals have equal width. So um, the formal definition of a, of a partition is that you start, it's going to be a list of points x0, x1, all the way up to x. And, and maybe I'll, I'll label this like this. And it'll have the property that x0 is equal to a, that xn is equal to b, and that these points are increasing. Like they actually have to be in increasing order so that they actually make up endpoints of subintervals. Xi has to be less than Xi plus one. But other than that, that's the only requirement for a partition. And now, uh, if, if I look here at, uh, maybe I'll X minus to Xi. If I look here at, at any particular interval, this will be like the, the ith subinterval, like going from x0 to x1 would be like the first subinterval. This would be like the ith subinterval. And I'll define now delta xi to be xi minus xi minus 1. And so, but, but now the delta xi's, they could all have different lengths because your partition could be. Could, could doesn't have to be uniform. And in, some people call this the width. Some people call it the mesh. Um, some people call it the norm. Uh, so I'll, I'll define the, the, I'll just call it the mesh. I'll d d define the mesh of the partition to be the largest of all these delta x's, so the maximum of all the delta xi's. As i goes from one to n. So in other words, given a partition, the, the mesh of that parti partition is going to be the length of the largest subinterval contained inside that partition. So any questions, comments, anything about that, that terminology? And then what we'll do is for each interval, you know, first interval, second one, ith interval, whatever, for each interval, just pick a point anywhere in that interval. These are called um, sample points. So you can pick what we call Sample points uh, C1 all the way up to Cn, and these just have the property that um, you're just picking a sample point like somewhere in that subinterval. And if you're always picking Ci equals xi minus 1, that's going to be a left end point. If you're always picking ci to be the midpoint, that would be like midpoints. If you're always picking ci to be xi, that would be like right-hand points. And um, so then what you want to do is you've got some, some function going from a to b. You've picked some partition. And you've picked some sample points. 
So what you want to do is you want to, for each sample point, take the y value, take f of that sample point, so f of ci, and then uh, that's going to be the height of the corresponding rectangle. So this one would go up here and make the height of the corresponding rectangle there. This one goes up here. You get the idea. This one goes up there. This one goes here. So from a so from a partition and a selection of sample points, you're able to construct a approximation of the signed area as follows. So you're doing height is f of ci and the base is delta xi, and then you're just adding up all these approximating rectangles from goes from one to to n, and this is called a Riemann sum. Uh, we do our, we use the notation RFP for Riemann sum for function f and partition p. And I guess it also depends on the sample points. So you might write uh, C for the collection of the sample points. And so given a collection of sample points, a partition, and a continuous function from A to B, you can calculate this sum of approximating rectangles. And like as I was mentioning, like choosing sample points to be right in points gives you, gives you R. Rn, choosing sample points to be left end points gives you Ln, so on and so forth. But more generally, you can make a Riemann sum from any such partition, any such choice of sample points. And now you can make the definition of the integral from A to B of f of x dx. And so what it is, is it's going to be the limit. And it, and before I was thinking like limit as the number of rectangles went to infinity. Um, here for just like a general partition, I could imagine a situation where like I kept this width fixed, which is giving me like a bad approximation, but I was, I was choosing like infinitely smaller rectangles over here. It's not a good way to get the area under the curve. So what, what you need or the condition that you need is not just an infinite number of rectangles. You need that the mesh of the partitions is going to zero. So you're wanting to take a limit of Riemann sums and you want to consider all possible partitions for some fixed function, you want to consider all possible partitions, all possible collections of sample points uh, to approximate the signed area width. And if those approximations get better and better and settle down and converge as the largest width or the mesh of your partition goes to zero, then that's defined to be the integral, then that's defined to be the signed area. There are cases where this limit will not exist, um, but there is a theorem outside the scope of this class that says if f of x is a continuous function on the interval from a to b, then this limit will always exist, and that's defined. Uh, then you know this is this is defined then to be the integral from a to b f of x. If this limit exists, the function is called Riemann integrable. So are there any questions on that definition? So the quest, there's one question, what does RFPC mean? And this is what it means. This is its definition. So it's, it's the Riemann sum. It's an approximation of the signed area um, using the sample points to get the various heights of the rectangles and using the very the partitions. So any other questions, comments?
So the question is like, how do you actually calculate these? Like how do you actually calculate these integrals? And that's, that's a, a hard question. Um, eventually we'll use something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. For right now, for just playing with the definition, um, it's probably easiest to calculate uh, answers by picking right-hand endpoints or left-hand endpoints. So even though this definition is very general, uh, you may calculate it by doing something like uh, limit as n goes to infinity of of Rn, right? This definition is general enough or broad enough to say that you can calculate it different ways using right-hand endpoints, left-hand endpoints, or, or midpoints, you'll get the same answer. And we've already done that, right? Because what we did yesterday, I'll, I'll recontextualize it here. What we did yesterday, we took, um, f of x equals x, we went from, I mean, I just went from zero to x, but in this new notation, I'll go from like a equals zero, um, b is whatever it is. And so this is the point b, b. Definitely the area of this triangle. So if, if I wanna take the integral from zero to b of x dx, that's going to be the area of this triangle, which is just going to be one half base times height. So it's going to be b squared over two. So like using the interpretation of signed area, I could quickly see, excuse me, that this is going to be b squared over two. On the other hand, last time at the end of class, I calculated limit as n goes to infinity of Rn and showed you that that was also equal to b over 2. So meaning that you can you can do your partition I'm not drawing that quite right. You can do your partition. And let the number of rectangles go to infinity, and you'll still get the, the same answer. And we had to use this uh, formula for the sum of the first n numbers in order to do that. But that's that's our first result, right? That actually the um, integral of x from 0 to b is b squared over 2. We can do some other initial So what about the integral of a constant? Like, let's say y is equal to some constant k. It's the integral of a constant function. And so if I want to calculate integral from a to b of y equals f of x, so just this constant function k dx. Say I want to do that with end endpoints. So ln, ln is the sum from 0 to n minus 1 of f of x i delta x. So let me give you a moment. Can you work with this definition, make a few more chains of equalities? Can you prove that this integral has to be equal to the area of this rectangle, namely k times b minus a? So take a few minutes. Can you write out this formula? Can you? 
uh, calculate the limit. Can you get that, that answer? Can everybody hear me okay now? Yeah, it looks a little better. So after giving you some time to work, uh, let's work this out. So um, remember when you're using equal width partition, delta x is always b minus a over n. So that's fine. And remember, for constant function, f of x i is just equal to the constant. So what we are looking at here, what we're looking at here is the limit. n goes to infinity. i goes from 0 to n minus 1 of <clears throat> uh, k times b minus a over n. And uh, so what you can do is you can start factoring out these constants. So, so this is a sum of n terms, k times b minus a over 1, k plus k times b minus a over 2, so on and so forth. Factor that out of the summation sign. And in fact, since you're taking a limit as n goes to infinity, uh, this k times b minus a is actually a constant with respect to n, so you don't have to do it this way, but I can even just rewrite this as k times b minus a times the limit as n goes to infinity. i goes from 0 to n minus 1 of 1 over n. And then you have to ask yourself, like, what what does this thing in the rectangle mean? So i goes from 0 all the way up to n minus 1. So there's n terms in this summation. And uh, i is the variable here. And I'm plugging i into the formula. Of course, it's just constant, 1 over capital N. So I'm just adding this constant to itself n times. So what this is. limit n goes to infinity of n times 1 over n. So add something together n times, then you're multiplying it by n. Of course, this is just limit as n goes to infinity of 1. 
And so the answer is k times b minus a as expected. Uh, the point here being that your approximations are, are not just approximations. They're, they're literally right at every stage. You have the right formula. You're just dividing it by n and adding it to itself n times. So it always cancels. You're always left with, with k times b minus a. I'll do one more. Uh, this time I'll do right endpoints. Let's, let's take the integral from 0 to b of x squared. So we did x. Let's do x squared. So I want to calculate this as limit as n goes to infinity of sum using right endpoints. So I'm going from 1 to n. f of x i times delta x, remembering that delta x is um, b minus a over n, so in this case, b over n. And remembering that x i is equal to a plus i times delta x, which is 0 plus i times delta x. So x i is nothing but i times b over n. This is the formula for the i point in the partition. And let's start plugging things in. So I'm doing a sum from i goes from 1 to n, f of x i. So f of x is x squared xi is i times b over n, so I'm getting i squared times b squared over n squared. That's f of xi times delta x. Uh, delta x is b over n, and I want to take the limit of this as n goes to infinity. Um, what's the difference between n and n minus 1 in the formula? Uh, the difference is that last time I was using left-hand endpoints, so ln, and this time I'm using right-hand endpoints. So uh, this is the right-hand endpoint approximation. In, those, in that approximation, you're using right-hand endpoints, so you would start with i equals 1 and end at, at n in order to do that. You can also do this with left-hand endpoints. So if you want to go back and redo this calculation, um, with the other approximation. That's a good exercise, and it will work out for you. So what I want to do now, um, I want to calculate this sum. And so for the sum, my variable is i, i going from 1 to n, and the capital N squared, the b, uh, all of that stuff I can factor out. It appears in every term. It's a constant. I can factor it out in front of the sum. So that's exactly what I'll do. I'll, I'll take b squared times b is b cubed, n squared times n is n cubed, and now I've got the sum, i goes from 1 to n, of i squared. And so this is the sum of the first uh, capital N squares. And so for that, you can just use the formula. Uh, we talked to, like I, I showed you how to how to prove that the sum of the first n numbers was n times n plus 1 over 2. Uh, for the other, you know, the, the, they're called power sums, power sum formulas. Uh, their, their formulas are equations 3, 4, and 5 on page 291. Um, you, you're free to use these formulas uh, without proving them. Um, like it, in your work, so they're they're available. Uh, the formula for the first, but but I'll talk to you about how to prove them if you're interested. So the formula for the sum of the first um, n squares is given to us by n cubed over three plus n squared over two plus n 
over six. So this is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of b cubed over n cubed times, what was it, n cubed over 3 plus n squared over 2 plus n over 6. And so we just now need to take this limit as, as n goes to infinity, and then we're finished. And uh, these two terms are going to go to 0, because when you multiply this out, you'll have n squared on top, n cubed on the bottom. So that'll be like a 1 over n term. It's going to 0. Uh, this term will go to 0 because it's n over n cubed. So uh, 1 over n squared times 6 is certainly tending towards 0 as n uh, goes to infinity. So it's this first term is the only one that's going to be non-zero. Uh, nevertheless, I'll include one more step. So just doing that algebra, I'm getting b cubed over 3 plus b cubed over 2n plus b cubed over 6n squared. And so you can see what's happening. We're letting n go to infinity. This term will go to 0 as its denominator blows up. This term goes to 0 as its denominator blows up. This term is not affected by n. So we're left with b cubed over 3 as our, as our uh, final answer there. And what are we concluding? I mean, we're concluding that the integral from 0 to b of x squared dx is equal to b cubed over 3. And geometrically, what's the significance of that? So the significance would be that you look at the graph of y equal to x squared then the area under that curve and um, above the x-axis, that area is actually equal to b cubed over 3, which is kind of interesting. I think that's cool. So that's like a new area formula that maybe you've never seen before. If you think about it, all the area formulas we know from grade school, they're for like a circle, they're for, they're for a rectangle. We don't have them for these weird irregular shapes, but, but now, we've, now we've got it. You can turn this around so you can use area formulas that you already know to calculate integrals. So here's a... A, a nice one. So let's look at y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. So like, I'll, I'll pose this to you as a question. So say I want to find the area from 0, the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of 4 minus x squared dx. I mean, you look at this and like my heart would just sink if I thought I had to go through the entire, you know, approximation with right hand endpoints and everything. But, but, but like, if you think about this in terms of area, so think for a second, can you find the answer of, uh, for that, for that integral? I'll give you a couple moments.
Uh. Okay, after letting you think, I think the trick to this, so I always test this every year and, and someone always tries to, to use a Riemann sum to solve this, um, which, is, uh, which is always like heartbreaking to see that on the test. Uh, so, so we want to we want to solve this one um, by by using signed area. Uh, so, how can I figure out like what is the area uh, under the curve and above the axis? So, I have to know like what this curve represents. And so, if I if I square both sides, I've got y squared equals four minus x squared. So, x squared plus y squared equals four. So, this is an equation for a circle of radius two. And since I'm going from zero to two, I'm interested in the region under the curve from, from, you know, from zero to two. And the area of the entire circle would be pi r squared and the radius is two, so it would be four pi. And the, um, uh, the area of this region then would be one fourth of of that area. So this integral should be equal to, to pi. Do you remember pi is defined to be the ratio of the diameter of a circle to its circumference? It's kind of interesting, at least to me, that you could do this approximation scheme and like as a way of, of getting to a formula for that. I showed you this approximation last time on Desmos. I think I'll go ahead and bring it up bring it up again since we're talking about it again. Let me share this with you. So let's take the square root of four minus x squared. And let's use, um, a equals zero, b equals two. And let's use uh, right-hand sums. Start out with ten rectangles. So this is what the right hand approximation looks like for, for ten rectangles. And they've got here the formula for for the left hand, um, left hand approximation, but that, that's just what they are. That's what's always displayed when you but when you change the slider. You can change it from like you you can change the different sums, and so this number i is the number that it adds up to. So the approximation is two point nine at this point. And of course, what we're doing is taking the limit of these approximations and it should land us right on pi. So we can just try moving the slider to 20, creeping up to, to 3.028 to 60, looking a lot better. Although there's still this little tail end where we're not doing quite as good. Move it up to 120, so we're getting closer and closer. So now at 760, I can barely tell that we're approximating at all. And we're getting close to 3.14. I'll play the movie. Let's see if we can um, kind of slow it down. It's still pretty fast.
Well, is that the slowest it can go? Yeah, so let's show the movie of the increasing number of rectangles, and you can see how the approximation changes as we go from one to a thousand. So as we get up to around 300 rectangles, I can't really tell the difference anymore, but maybe we can zoom in a little bit and you can still see it. You know, as we're adding, it looks like a little staircase as we're like adding more and more. So as we get closer to a thousand, I guess the little gaps should get smaller and smaller. You can see they're starting to get smaller. And you can see the scale we're working on, it's about two one hundredths. And so like each one of these, it's like times 800 that's contributing to the error. So that's why we're, we're not exactly converging to 3.14159 um, super quickly because these errors are pretty persistent. The sawtooths, they're not really, it's kind of difficult to get rid of them super fast. Depends on the scale you're operating at, right? Because if we zoom out, then I can't really tell the difference. Okay, so just um, a few more things to start to make your life easier for calculating these. Nice thing about integrals is they are linear. So like if you have integral from A to B of F of X plus G of X, then you can write this as integral of F plus integral of g, and I've got a separate video like explaining that, but basically uh, this is linear because sums and limits are, are linear. And if you wanted to prove that, you'd have to say, well, um, this limit, remember, is, this integral, remember, is a limit as the width of the partition goes to zero of, of whatever rebound sum, and the Riemann sum is i goes from 1 to n of f of ci plus g of ci times delta xi. And so you can kind of see where this is going, because if I distribute out the delta xi and make it the sum of f of ci delta xi plus the sum of g of ci delta xi, and then I realize that the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Uh, I can see how it becomes the definition of this plus that. So please, please see my video for further details. And like a similar thing, like if you take a constant times a function, then this will be a constant times the integral. of the function. And that works out in a similar way because the, the Riemann sum for this is you're taking a limit as the width of the partition goes to zero of, of C of, of the sum of C times F of like CI times delta XI. And so you can just factor C out of the sum. And in fact, you can bring it out of the limit. That's a limit law. And that'll be C times the limit, which is C times the integral. But the upshot is that now you can use these to um, calculate integrals of things that are, that are built up.
from other things. So like, it's all good. So for instance, um, if you wanted to do integral from zero to two of x plus square root of 4 minus x squared dx, you might not immediately know, like geometrically, what's the shape traced out by a circle plus the line. But what you can do is use linearity and say, I do know that this is x, you know, integral of x plus integral square root 4 minus x squared. And now I can say that I remember that this is 4 over 2, so b squared over 2. And that this one, um, so it was pi because we just calculated it. So this one is two plus plus pi. So that's an example of using this linearity property in order to take two things that we already know and calculate something that we didn't know before. Okay, so learning objectives today. Learning objectives today, uh, what's the definition of an integral? What's the definition of a partition, uh, sample points? Uh, like, what is a Riemann sum? Uh, we learned that the integral is signed area. We learned that taking a definite integral is, is linear. And we did a couple more examples besides. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. We'll see you on Monday. Remember, our next exam is coming up on Wednesday. I've put information about that on the Google Classroom. Your next manuscript is not due until May 10th, but that prompt is up and you're welcome to start learning about it. It's gonna be based on section 4.8 from the book. So thank you everybody and have a great weekend.